The other times we may use x-rays is to identify the possibility of a knife that may have broken off during a, an assault or an attack. If there's an explosion, what we're going to be looking for are pieces of the bomb or shrapnel. Probably a bit of jacket up there, so that's great. So why don't we get a lateral of that before, before we... So we're going to document the presence or absence of those things. Once the bullet has been located, the body is ready for autopsy. 911 call set up. A couple of shots fired. And no further history from the scene? Not that we know of. We're working on that right now. Is there much blood loss here? The person responsible for what happens to that body is the coroner. It's very important that that uh, body is kept under custody and um, in control until the completion of our investigation. So that body will be bagged at the scene. A special seal will be put over the bag so it's clear that no one has interfered with the body until the autopsy is performed. And then just prior to conducting the autopsy, the seal will be removed in front of the pathologist. And that ensures that there's no break in that chain of evidence as far as investigating the body. Looking at the x-ray, projectile looks like they're full metal jacket, so it's quite possibly a pistol used versus a long arm or a revolver. In a complex death investigation like a homicide, there's many players involved, where we have experts from the police, pathologist, biology, toxicology, firearms, whoever we may need to bring in, depending upon the specific death investigation. Now, it's the coroner who's the quarterback for that overall investigation. That certainly would fit with this entrance down to here, Toby, and these others being through and through. Yeah, three holes in the church. Right. One of the integral links in the forensic chain is the firearms experts. The clues they gather add another chapter to the story. Since their inception in the 15th century, guns have revolutionized the act of murder. Dr. Barry McClellan sees their deadly results increase every year. The most common weapons that we come across in our coroner's death investigations are guns and knives. And there's been a dramatic increase in the number of homicides as a result of, of guns, handguns, rifles, shotguns, in the past 10 or 15 years, especially in large cities. As a result, an entire division of forensic study has been dedicated to firearms. Bob Warburton has worked with guns since he was 12 years old. My parents were both competition or state pistol shooters, so I grew up traveling around the countryside attending all these gun clubs. So it was a natural progression from being in the police service into the forensic firearm identification, where I could use my skills and knowledge of gun manufacture and the firearm industry. Crimes involving guns could not be solved without the firearms experts. And then they might call upon us to assist at the scene to interpret the evidence. And interpret the evidence might mean to analyze trajectories to see which way a bullet might have come from, to see how far away a gun might have been fired from, to assist in the location of evidence that might be left at the scene. In order to link the weapon to the crime, the gun is run through a series of tests. Every gun leaves a unique signature on its bullets. Annalisa La Calamita is an expert in the science of guns. On a bullet, as it travels down the barrel of the gun, the gun transfers the unique markings it possesses onto the bullet itself. Every bullet's jacket starts out pristine and smooth. Once a gun is fired, this smooth bullet spins down the barrel, scraping its sides. So when you look at a bullet microscopically, you see what we call striations. Since every gun is unique, um, every gun will create different sets of striations. And essentially, they look like scratches running the length of the bullet. It almost looks like a barcode. 
Forensically, these barcodes provide irrefutable proof linking the gun to the crime. But to put the puzzle together, Warburton needs all the pieces. The gun from the crime scene and the bullet from the body. We do then fire that gun into a water recovery tank and we use water because it's a very good medium to stop bullets. Bullets are designed to travel through the air. Water offers a, a greater resistance in the air and it slows the projectile down rapidly without putting damage onto the projectile. We test fire the gun into the water tank and then we get the bullet out of the end of the water tank that's come from that gun so we can compare it to other bullets that we've recovered from crime scenes. Both bullets are now compared under a microscope. If the striations match, there is absolutely no doubt about the murder weapon. While the bullets give away the identity of the gun, the victim's clothing can reveal where the shots came from. When a gun is fired, it's not only the bullet that exits the barrel of the gun, but you also have what we call firearms discharge residues. So the closer that the target surface is to the gun, these deposits will actually place themselves onto the, the target surface. The size and pattern of the gun residue can tell La Calamita precisely how far the shooter was standing from the victim when he fired the gun. Now, as the muzzle to target distance increases, you're gonna have less of those deposits because they can't travel as far. So at seven feet, you don't have any of that black cloud, which was soot, and you also do not have any of the partially burned and unburned powder particles around the hole. So this would be indicative of a distant shot until eventually you're gonna have no deposits and just a bullet hole uh, on the garment clothing. So the pattern or lack of pattern produced by those firearms discharge residues is going to be compared to test panels that we make using the suspect gun and ammunition at various distances. Most crime scenes provide investigators with more than enough information to solve the crime. Coping with that information can be difficult. In my experience as working as a firearm examiner, I've tended hundreds, getting close to a thousand different crime scenes involving where people have been violently injured. I do have some very vivid images that will remain with me. I do see them sometimes at night time, but you put that aside and you get on with your job and you record the details. But it's up to the pathologist to record the graphic details of injuries to the body. Those wounds can lead investigators straight to a weapon. and injuries to the human body speak volumes. They reveal how the victim died and what was used to kill them. Dr. Toby Rose understands the language of wounds and weapons. Injuries, for example, that occur either self-inflicted injuries by accident or that occur from one person injuring another person are of particular interest to forensic pathologists. We're going to each other? There's an x-ray over on the light box. We have certain questions that we want to answer on every case, and so the questions are the same about homicides. And the basic question is really, what's the cause of death and how did this person die? I don't see any rib fractures or anything else to indicate the path. Okay. So we'll be looking for one bullet inside. Her most pressing concern is to figure out the cause and manner of death. This will lead her to the weapon. 
We want to determine the cause of death, and that means the basic injury or illness that caused the person to die. Something like loss of blood or an arrhythmia of the heart which causes the heart to stop beating ultimately. In determining the manner of death, we have to consider the circumstances more. There are five choices. There is natural, suicide, accident, homicide, or undetermined in cases where there's evidence pointing to more than one manner of death. The instant a weapon has been used to kill, post-mortem changes to the body begin. These changes are also clues the pathologist uses to determine what may have happened. The body temperature begins to drop, and the gradual onset of rigor mortis, or stiffening, begins. These changes help investigators in determining time of death. When the heart stops beating, gravity causes blood to pool to the lower parts of the body. This staining is called lividity. And if a body is moved after this kind of staining occurs and is left in a different position, then it can be quite obvious that the body has been moved from the position in which it died. In many cases, a killer will attempt to make a homicide look like a suicide. Dr. Rose has seen this before and isn't fooled. We always want to be sure that we catch all the homicides. There's a famous case of a woman who was found at home, seated quietly in a chair, holding a gun and with a gunshot wound in her mouth. She was still holding the gun loosely in her hand. And the initial investigation pointed to suicide. The scene was too good. What was missing was a condition called instantaneous rigor mortis, an instant stiffening of the body, often present in suicide victims. In a classic case, the gun that, that the person used to kill himself or herself would be clenched firmly in the hand. But this was not a case of instantaneous rigor mortis because the gun was loosely in the hand. Now that doesn't happen. Guns have recoil and they will not just stay loosely in somebody's hand. And this one looks like an exit. That's pretty, uh... After thousands of autopsies, Dr. Rose has a clear understanding of the relationship between wound and weapon. Blunt force injuries caused by objects like bats and crowbars. Lacerations that result from beatings. Sharp force injuries from weapons like knives. And of course, gunshot wounds. In general, there are two kinds of gunshot wounds. There's an entrance wound caused where the bullet goes into the body and there's an exit wound caused where the bullet comes out of the body. In some cases, of course, the bullet stops inside the body so that there will be an entrance wound with no corresponding exit wound. Entrance wounds are generally small, clean, round holes. Exit wounds are not as tidy. There are classic entrance wounds, classic exit wounds, but there are some wounds that are more confusing. And so it takes a lot of experience in determining those kinds of wounds. I feel something just under the skin here. So that could be that. Okay, well, we'll start with that one. Okay. Bullets follow the rules of physics, but they can hit organs inside the body, like bones, and they can be deflected from a straight path. Uh, 36. Do you? That looks like an entrance wound. So sometimes it gets complicated. And in a person who's had many gunshot wounds, like up to 12, so there can be as many as 24 defects, it can be like solving a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, and I just 
just need the distance from the head. Processing the dead can be a demanding and soul-searching job. It is hard to deal with death every day. Uh, one of my philosophies about it, though, is that the families of dead people deserve to have nice people looking at their cases and concerned about their loved ones as well.